Hey traders, welcome to a global macro update. We are changing up a little bit. We're going to split up the two global macro updates into a more commodity side where we're going to talk about gold, silver, and oil. And then we're going to do this current video, which is going to talk about indices. And then we're also going to go over the US dollar. But first, like always, we will go over some fundamental news catalysts or some fundamental news stories that will impact or has impacted the price recently. So the two things that we can see right here, stock rise as investors show optimism over Gilead coronavirus treatment and U.S. reopening. I don't know. I think it's Gilead or Guy Lead, but we can see uh, they have produced a rapid recovery in coronavirus patients, report said, or the drug has produced rapid recovery. But uh, we can see within this paragraph, there's no proven treatment or vaccines for the novel coronavirus, which has sickened more than 2 million people worldwide and killed no, nearly 150,000 people. But their drug, Remdesivir, Remdesivir, I think that's what you say it, is considered a front runner in the race to develop a treatment for COVID-19 infections that works. Through the findings reported by the SAT are promising. They are not based on full clinical data from the company. So they haven't gone through all the different phases for the clinical trials, but uh, there is some positive news regarding their drugs. So, you know, people are more optimistic because obviously finding some help or some vaccine would be good. This is not a vaccine, but it is positive news. And this is the guidelines. Trump has been talking about trying to reopen the U.S. economy uh, for a while now, and he has finally announced certain guidelines, different phases or steps that the economy is going to take to try to open back up. So let's first look at this paragraph here. So there are uh, the protocol is titled "Opening Up America Again." And it does not suggest a time frame for which states should lift res restrictions as the president has suggested they might earlier this week. I still think it's definitely a little too soon, but let's continue reading on. I'm just going to get a little bit of coffee here. Governors will be empowered to tailor an approach that meets the diverse circumstances of their own state. So he's kind of just letting each state uh, assess how the conditions are and then kind of take action for what stage they think that they're at. The White House proposed a list of six metric states should six metrics states should satisfy before proceeding to a phased opening they include. So these are the different phases that the economy is going to open with. Uh, with this announcement that Trump has just stated. A decline of influenza-like illnesses reporting within a 15-day period and a downward trajectory of COVID-like cases reported within a 14-day period. That's the, this is the first set of metrics before they even start the phasing opening process. So that's the first, this is the first thing that they need to see before even uh, taking action. A decline in documented cases of COVID-19 within a two-week period or a decline in the share of co coronavirus tests that come back positive if test volume increases or remains flat. Hospitals with a jurisdiction should have the capacity to treat all patients without crisis care, and there should be a robust testing program in place for at-risk healthcare workers, including tests of the COVID-19 immunity. And this is the initial, uh, I guess, structure that we need to see before even starting the different stages. So if states meet these criteria, the guidelines suggest a three-phase approach to reopening the economy is, is what they're uh, implementing here. The first stage would involve reopening some businesses, including gyms, restaurants, movie theaters, and places of worship. Uh, and if they adhere to strict physical distancing and sanitation protocols, and these guidelines should remain, or these guidelines suggest schools should remain closed while employers should continue encourage telework when possible, and that non-essential travel be minimized. So that's the first stage. And then we see that the second stage is another 14-day period uh, with no evidence for a rebound for coronavirus cases. 
and that would be phase two, uh, during which schools and youth activities can resume, a large venues can operate under moderate physical distancing protocols. Uh, which is good, but you know we have seen in Singapore, in Thailand, in China, there are second, third waves that are coming back into uh, the population, into the economy. So it's not like the countries that are acting more aggressively are seeing, um, you know, one and done kind of waves that are re-emerging, and I think that it will be more drawn out than a lot of people may think. Under Phase, I think they're supposed to be three, but under phase three, after a third 14-day period without COVID-19 resurgence, restrictions would be greatly re relaxed with visitors to senior care facilities and hospitals allowed to resume, while restaurants, bars, movie theaters, sporting venues, and places of worship could operate under limited physical distancing protocols. So that is their plan. So they're basically taking the next step every 14 days. So the first step into even thinking about actually implementing the, uh, I guess, startup of the economy would be the 14 day period, uh, seeing a decline in influenza like symptoms like we talked about, and then the next 14 days would be the first stage, and then the third phase of the 14 day period, then we're actually seeing uh, the economy basically get back up to normal where you're seeing restaurants, bars, movie theaters, sporting venues all operating, still limited uh, physical distancing protocols though. But uh, that is their plan and we'll see how it goes. The last thing we're going to talk about is the Federal Reserve buying junk bonds. So I don't know how you feel about this, but in my personal belief, I really don't think that this is capitalism at this point because they're literally buying anything and um, the people who are on the other side of the bet now have zero risk and you know unlimited upside potential really because the Fed will just keep on printing money to purchase these junk bonds and they're in it was the same thing in 2008 uh, you know they were buying up really everything that they could get their hands on and they're now going into ETFs and, you know, the equities is the line that you can't really cross back. So let's continue here. The Federal Reserve is now buying junk bonds and analysts at Jefferies argue that presents an opportunity for investors to load up on shares of leveraged companies that are out of favor. So in my opinion, how does this make sense? You're buying leveraged up companies that are in the junk, junk bond category and you really have zero downside because the Fed will just keep on buying these ETFs. Investors are already uh, already reacted to the Fed's announcement by sending the iShares iBox High Yield Corporate Bonds or HYG up 6.5% uh, to almost 82 or closes at 8236 on April 9th. HYG pays a monthly dividend and it has a yield of 5.31%, which compares to a yield of 3.14 for the investment grade corporate bonds, which is LQD, and 2.04 for the Vanguard Intermediate Term Treasuries, VT, v, uh, VGIT. So basically what I see is, you know, investors shouldn't worry about risk. They should always go for the high yield because there's no risk if the Fed is always going to be able to just print money and just buy really whatever is going down. And it's really incentivizing investors to not look at the downside, look at the reward, just keep on trying to get the permables to buy the dip. There's no recession. And that's obviously going to impact them some way, shape or form. Every action has a reaction. And um, yeah, th this is unbelievable in my personal belief. I just, I can't believe that they're buying uh, junk bonds, but that is the reality that we are living in is uh, the Fed literally buying everything that they can hands on and they will continue in my personal belief. All right. So in that said, you do have to be careful for any shorts um, because obviously the Fed can just print and print and print and print, but you know, it's ultimately uh, the decision of uh, how much confidence you really have. Uh, in, in the US dollar and in the stock market really uh, with the Fed being able to save the day time and time again. So now that the news story is complete, we'll now get into the charts, my favorite part of the day. Going to get a little bit of coffee and then we'll jump right into the SPX. All right, so let's zoom out on the four hour time frame and then actually let's go to the daily and then we'll move on to the four hour time frame 
four hour time frame and then one hour time frame. So first things first, we are still within our supply zone here. We have touched that uh, previous high that we had back in the 14th of April. Pretty big gap up uh, from what we stated before. The announcements of the phases of the reopening of the economy as well as some sort of positive news re regarding uh, Gilead's new drug. But at the end of the day, I don't think uh, that's really going to do much in, in the long-term bullish move. But what we can see right now is we're still making these uh, pushes to the upside, but it's just a matter of if we're going to hold. So we can just talk about it right here. So what I did see is this squeeze like that, and we had a resistance right here. So we did push to the downside, and then now we're retesting this previous resistance yet again for another level of resistance, but we're also testing this previous support as a resistance as well. So there's not much more to go and discuss on the daily chart. I think the four hour gives a, a lot more clear of a picture. And first we will take away, actually we'll leave that. Just, I guess, make sure that uh, you understand that there's two trend lines there. All right, so, oops, didn't click that all the way. So we got two trend lines. The first one that we drew in was this one, which was creating an ascending wedge within the price action with the resistance right here. And we saw a squeeze and it pushed the price out below the support, giving me an indication that, yeah, we could see some sell pressure coming into the market. Uh, we didn't really see any sell pressure come into the market. We held the support one, two, three times, and then we got a strong push to the upside overnight. And we opened at the high, and now we're coming back down after hitting the resistance multiple times. So basically, all that we had to hold at that point was this key trend line right here which connected the higher highs and we made another higher high so although we did push to the downside and hold on the one hour on the four hour does still look like we're still making some higher highs and higher lows which isn't ideal for our short bias but hey we're still holding below this resistance zone and We've seen it time and time again, hold below the 618. So it still does look like we could see a move to the downside. Let's now look on the one hour to kind of discuss a little bit greater detail of what we can see on the smaller time frames. All right, it's gonna get my mouse to push back in there. And then we will continue the analysis. So on the one hour time frame, we see that this trend line was pretty well respected. I'll put that in like so. Not perfectly straight, but you get the idea of the two trend lines that I'm currently seeing. So the price was bouncing in between here, seeing the price gets closer and closer towards the apex of the pattern. And then we did get a push down below the support there. And then we started creating these lower lows and lower highs. This is a low, this is a higher low, this is a higher low, this is a lower low, lower low. And then it started making lower highs as well. So we started seeing a lower low, lower high structure. And we also created, in my opinion, somewhat of a head and shoulders where you see a potential left shoulder, right shoulder and a head. So you got the head and shoulders formation right here, which is within the 61.8 61.8 and then the 50 percent 50 uh 50 percent retracement level within our key level of supply so that did indicate a potential weakening from the buyers but uh, as we can see they did push the price back up and we did retest this key level of resistance yet again we did see a nice hesitation to go above and then we we're consolidating very tightly within that ascending wedge yet again. And then now we dumped back down within kind of the lower half of the wedge. So in my personal belief, it's still looking bearish. Yes, we are still seeing these higher highs coming into the market, but I can't, I can't have a bullish bias right now. It's just look at the fundamentals. It just does not make sense. It, uh, in my opinion, is still very, very structurally sound for our short opportunity. Um, now that we are kind of consolidating sideways, I did draw in this ascending zone yet again. This is where we held not once, not twice, but three times within that support there. So now we see the price go below the support coming to our secondary ascending zone. But, you know, as long as we're holding below our key level of resistance, which is this trend line right here. Let's just make it 
very large so everyone knows. This trend line right here is the main zone that we want to see hold. As long as it's holding that zone, I'm very happy with just sitting and patiently waiting because in my opinion, uh, this is a pretty uh, overextended exhaustion phase to the upside because every market has to move in cycles. There's the push phase and then there's the exhaustion phase. I think that we're in the exhaustion phase, which is the pullback, and I think we're gonna make the next leg down. All right, so um, that's basically the analysis. We'll kind of play out a few other options here. Let's say the sentiment is still bullish uh, what we could see is the price continue to make a series of higher highs and higher lows, but we have this ascending uh, resistance here holding us from making significantly higher highs, which in my opinion is still a little bit bearish. Now, in that said, if we see a break above the zone and if we break the 61.8 Fib level, which is a retracement from the low, to the high, it's 61.8% to the top of the stock market. If it breaks above that zone, my bias will change because I've back tested 2001 and 2008. We haven't seen a retracement above 61.8% uh, in terms of the retracement level. If it goes above it, there's a high probability of just going back all the way up to 100% like we saw in 2018, uh, like we saw in you know, 2015 and 2016, those flash crashes, we saw a huge recovery. And after the 61.8, it's a pretty quick, sharp move back up to the all time high. And uh, it's crazy to me that uh, it's a possibility just with the Fed, but you know, you can't discount it out of it. You, you can't assume that it's never going to happen. My bias is still going to be bearish. And as long as we're sticking below this zone, I am still bearish because we've broken this wedge. In my opinion, this is a little bit more bearish because we pushed below the zone. And now we're gonna be trading within our new range, which is gonna be this resistance and this level of support. So it's a widening, you could say microphone, you could say it's a widening range, uh, which is increasing in volatility, which in my opinion, is a little bit more bearish because volatility usually is way more to the downside than to the upside. You don't see much volatility to the upside within the S&P in normal conditions. It's usually initiated by a massive move to the downside and then you start to see the volatility. So if you're seeing a widening range, the volatility is increasing and because volatility is more to the downside, I think that we could see a spill uh, to the downside and it's a higher probability than moving to the upside in my personal belief. One thing to note uh, and one thing, oops, let's get that back and zoom out a little bit just on the two hour. One thing to note is we do have a potential level of confluence where we have this support right here where we currently held like so and we have our main ascending wedge support which is right here and it's creating a level of confluence right here. Now, if the price does break that zone, in my opinion, there's a high level of confidence get, that gets lost by the bulls, and then there's going to be some level of sell pressure that's going to push the price down. At that point, if we do see the price break this zone, we're probably going to see a series of lower highs. We could connect it with a descending trend line, and then we could potentially find a horizontal zone that we can use to create our descending triangle pattern, which we have an edge trading. So that's gonna be a possible op opportunity and an option for us. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we have made our decision. We see that the price broke this initial ascending zone. It came back into it. Sellers held it yet again. That's super bearish in my personal view with an ascending zone. You know, usually if it breaks to the downside, you're going to get a strong move. But if it is able to actually hold, and then move back up into the wedge, usually that indicates that there's enough bullish pressure to push back up and we didn't see it. We got a failure back down. So we did get a move back into the wedge, but then we got a failure to push back down. So the sellers at the resistance are really showing their strength in my personal view. So uh, the short is not 
uh, complete. In my opinion, the short bias is still in play. And yeah, I'm definitely not looking at longing at all in my personal view. Even with positive outlooks on the different phases, I just can't imagine this being a recovery that's going to go like that. There's just look at the numbers, look at the stats, look at the stats coming from the Fed, it's earnings season, I think that we will have another move to the downside. Now we're not just looking at the S&P, we're also looking at the US dollar index. Now why are we looking at the US dollar index? Well, if stocks take a tumble, every single US equity is paired with the US dollar, right? So like in crypto, like in the foreign exchange market, Everything is a pair. So when things are selling in the US stock market, people are buying the US dollar. So what we're looking for is an inverse relationship. If the S&P goes down, you're looking for the US dollar to go up, right? Ideally, in, in a perfect world, the US dollar is also affected largely by the globe because it's the world reserve currency. Basically, almost all commodities are attached to it. Look at coffee, soybeans, gold, silver, oil, everything's kind of uh, related to the US dollar. So if there is a sell off somewhere else, people are going to be buying the US dollar or converting it. But we can see that there is a pretty high correlation between negative correlation between the US dollar and US stocks. So now let's look at the DXY, which is the US dollar index comprised mainly by 60% euro, I believe and 15 or 16% of the Japanese yen. Um, I did, there's some GBP, uh, Swiss franc, I don't exactly know the percentages, but it's comparing to different FX currencies. And what we're looking for is a bullish pattern, because if we're bearish on the SPX, we should be looking for bullish opportunities on the DXY, because if the SPX does sell off, goes down, people are going to be converting their value from equities into the US dollar because they're selling equities buying dollar. So what we're looking for is bullish opportunities or bullish price action patterns within the DXY. And in my opinion, we see it very, very clearly right now. Let's get our SNP and then discuss what we can see within the US dollar index. So first things first, uh, we are in the four hours, so we're not going to look at the super long term. We saw a huge grind up, slow, slow, and then we saw a massive dump and then a huge move up. And then now we're seeing a nice squeeze coming into the market. And that's currently what we see on the larger time frames. And this is that squeeze. This is that huge sell off. And then we got a massive rally at kind of the start of March here when things really started to sell off. And then now we have this huge squeeze coming into the market where you see a series of low, lower low, lower low, lower low, and then you see it, or sorry, high, lower high, lower high, lower high, my bad. And then you're seeing a series of higher lows. So this is creating a nice squeeze where the price is getting funneled into an apex of the pattern, which is right around here. Now what do we see? We break the resistance. So we saw not one, two, three touches of a resistance making it a potentially valid zone. You see a break in the zone. You're not just looking for a break in the zone, but you're also combining structure of the market as well. So you're looking for that recent major high, which is right here at around, let's say 99.50. And then we see the price break the zone. Initially, we just see a wick on the four hours. So that's not really giving me strong confidence of a move up. But now what we're seeing is giving me a lot of confidence that we're going to get a potential surge in the US dollar. Why is that? Well, we got a pretty good structure within the one hour time frame where we've broken major zones of resistance and held major areas of support. All right, so we see that uh, this descending zone was tested as a nice level of support. Nice wick here representing that buyers were able to push the price right back up. And then we saw the price push back up to the high and then create a bit of a consolidation. So what we're looking for in a momentum shift from a downtrend consolidation to an uptrend is the formation of a series of lower lows and lower highs, which is a downtrend into a potential series of consolidation and then a series of higher highs and higher lows. Well, let's bring that into the current market structure. We saw a series of lower lows and lower highs. 
high, lower high, lower high, and then these lows right here. And then what did we see? We saw a market structure shift. Well, this is a low, this is a higher low. And then we saw a higher low, right? And then we start to see a consolidation where we see these lows form, not really making a lower low. And then you see a resistance, resistance hold. So now you're in a consolidation phase going sideways, which is good because now it seems like the price is able to hold a strong level of support, breaking the series of lower lows. So now we're going from a downtrend to sideways for the bulls. But what you're seeing now is a series of higher highs. So we were holding this sideways consolidation, but now you're seeing higher highs coming into the market. So you're funneling sideways and then you're breaking out into higher high, higher high. So the bulls are able to push the price higher and higher while, a, while holding a nice low. So in my opinion, this consolidation is actually a little bit more bullish, which is good because my view of the stock market is bearish. So what you're seeing is a potential zone like this and then a nice horizontal level of support. So I think it does look more bullish for the US dollar index. I know it sounds crazy because of all the money printing going on. It doesn't seem possible that the US dollar in, or the US dollar could be gaining strength with trillions of dollars being printed and introduced into the money supply. You know, if you increase the supply, theoretically the value of whatever it is should be going down, but with uh, the milkshake theory, if you if you don't know, uh, you know basically the U.S. dollar is soaking up all the emerging markets uh, because they need the U.S. dollar uh, to transact with commodities. The U.S. dollar is a global reserve, so everyone is wanting the U.S. dollar right now, and we can see it. In my opinion, being more bullish, we did see that huge downtrend, but now we're in a consolidation phase. Could see that starting of the uptrend because we look on the four hour time frame. Um, I think that these 103 ish highs could easily get hit again. Let's quickly look at the daily time frame here. Does not seem like it would be surprising. And even if we look at the weekly, there's this is a strong level that we've tested in the past. We can see 103 ish was, uh, was a high at December 2016. And then even looking back, it was a key level back in 1999. So uh, yeah, 103 is a strong zone. Wouldn't be surprising if we did test that again. Looking at the squeeze, looking at the smaller term price action, looking at how the holding of the support is uh, being held, I guess, by the bulls. That didn't really make a whole lot of sense. But we can see that it's from a descending zone to a consolidation and it's holding a nice level of support. So yeah, it's in confluence with this potential opportunity for a downside move. And that's basically the end of this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, I will be going over all questions at the end of the video, but in terms of the recording, I will cut it off there. Thank you very much for watching this global macro update. We will be going over gold and silver a little bit later today, but we thought we would split it up because of one, someone giving us feedback, and two, uh, I did think that it would make sense to kind of split up different parts of the global macro update because they do have different markets and different viewers may want to see them just makes sense to kind of focus on one certain topic so thank you very much for watching everyone and until next time have a good one